let me say that while the evening is young and we don't know yet what the final tally will be, I think we know enough to say with some certainty that New Hampshire tonight has made Bill Clinton the comeback kid. That was Arkansas Governor Bill Clinton the night of the 1992 New Hampshire Democratic primary. Upbeat message, excited crowd. Sounds like Bill Clinton won, right? Nope. The winner was Paul Sangas from Massachusetts. Hardly a surprise that a senator from a neighboring state would win New Hampshire. Yet the 1992 primary did have a surprise. A twist. Bill Clinton stealing the spotlight when he came in second. On this episode of C-SPAN's The Weekly, we'll remember, 30 years later, the 1992 New Hampshire Democratic primary one of the most fascinating and dramatic New Hampshire primaries ever, when Bill Clinton got all the attention for calling himself the comeback kid and ended up in the White House. In 1992, the early Democratic caucus in Iowa didn't matter. Iowa Democratic Senator Tom Harkin was in the race, so the other Democrats running for president didn't campaign there, which made the next event in the political calendar, the the first-in-the-nation New Hampshire primary, the real first contest. But with Paul Sangas of Massachusetts running, essentially as a favorite son, even that early contest might have become another yawner, a non-event. Then, during a rally in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, on January 26, 1992, this happened. Governor, you said uh, a few minutes ago that we'll find out uh, what you were yesterday. Is that an acknowledgement uh, that you had an affair with Mrs. Oh. Flowers? Oh. Wait, 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 be fair. Watch. Well, she cares. Watch. Watch 60 Minutes. I have said all I have to say, and I'm not going to say anymore. That's it. The woman in that clip asked Bill Clinton about Jennifer Flowers. Flowers had just come forward to say, that she had had a 12-year extramarital relationship with Bill Clinton, and he had assisted her in landing an Arkansas job. You heard Bill Clinton say, watch 60 Minutes, which that night, after the Super Bowl, ran an interview with him and Hillary Clinton about Jennifer Flowers. Here's a clip from that 60 Minutes interview. Steve Croft with both Clintons. He was an acquaintance, I would say a friendly acquaintance, uh, when this story, this rumor story got started in the middle of 1980 uh, and she was contacted and told about it, she was so upset and she called back and she said, how can I be listed on this? I haven't seen you for more than 10 minutes in 10 years. Uh, she would call from time to time when she was upset or thought she was really in uh, being hurt by the rumors. And uh, I would call her back. Uh, either she would call the office or I'd call her back there at the office or I'd call her back at the house. And, Hillary knew when I was calling her back. I think once uh, I called her when we were together. And so there's nothing uh, out of the ordinary there. She's a legend and is described in some detail in a supermarket tabloid, which she calls a 12-year affair with you. That allegation is false. And here's Jennifer Flowers the next day, January 27th, 1992, at a press conference in New York City reacting to Bill Clinton's appearance on 60 Minutes. Yes, I was Bill Clinton's lover for 12 years. And for the past two years, I have lied to the press about a relationship to protect him. The truth is, I loved him. Now he tells me to deny it. Well, I'm sick of all of the deceit, and I'm sick of all of the lies. Last night I sat and watched Bill on 60 Minutes. I felt disgusted and I saw a side of Bill that I had never seen before. He is absolutely lying. I'm disappointed, but realistically, I never thought he would come out and admit it. How did this national story play in New Hampshire, where the primary was three weeks away? Here's that night's report on WMUR News 9, New Hampshire's leading TV news station, with reaction from New Hampshire voters. You'll hear first anchor Kathy Burnham setting up the story. 
Tonight, political analysts and campaign staff members are waiting to see what kind of impact the Clinton allegations will have on New Hampshire voters. As WMUR Susan Masley reports, registered voters so far say they care more about the economy than the Arkansas governor's personal life. Many of New Hampshire's residents registering to vote today have been in front of their televisions all week watching allegations of infidelity against Governor Bill Clinton. From this city hall crowd come strong comments when it comes to whether Clinton's personal life should influence voters. It didn't really make much difference to me. I don't know. I, I, I think I'm going to vote on the issues rather than, you know, um, you know, the personal things. Everybody makes mistakes in their personal life. And, um, I mean, it doesn't say what kind of man he's going to be to run the country. Well, I think it's awful. They shouldn't bring up things. Some things should be private. If he had denied that he had ever done anything like that, and then, it, you know, we, there was proof later on that, in fact, he had, that would make a difference to me. This 73-year-old Republican is one of the few to admit he won't vote for a candidate accused of infidelity. I think it's an issue with anybody who's running for office, whether it's president or anything else. You can talk to the voters and you can watch the polls, but the only way the nation is going to find out exactly how New Hampshire residents will vote is by waiting for the answers after February 18th. In Manchester, Susan Masley, WMUR's News 9. But wait. There's more, a new story connecting Bill Clinton to the Vietnam War and the draft. A week before the New Hampshire primary, Bill Clinton made public a 1969 letter in which he thanked an Army officer overseeing the Reserve Officers Training Corps program at the University of Arkansas for saving me from the draft. Clinton released it to preempt news outlets from reporting the leaked letter first. Here's Bill Clinton at a February 12, 1992 press conference held at the Manchester, New Hampshire airport. For now, let me say that I'm glad to have the letter, despite the circumstances under which it surfaced, because it confirms what I have been saying all along and what is confirmed in an op-ed piece in the New York Times today. Before the lottery came into being, I gave back an ROTC student deferment and placed myself in the draft. This letter is the account of a conflicted and thoughtful young man who, like so many Americans at the time, sought a deferment from the draft, and who, like many others, made himself available for the draft. It's the letter of a young man who loved his country and had strong beliefs about what was right and wrong at that time. Like so many people in my generation, I felt a profound ambivalence. I loved my country, but I hated the war. I believed in our system as deeply as I believed the war was wrong. The American system had been good to me. It had given me opportunities and the chance to fulfill my dreams. As much as I opposed the war, I couldn't completely reject it. I wanted to go home and do what I could to work for progress in my home state, which is exactly what I have done for many years now. After a lot of anguished reflection, I came to the conclusion that I could not in good conscience simply defer my military service for four more years with a student disferment, and so I decided to enter the draft. After the press conference, Clinton campaign strategist James Carville met with reporters. He was asked why he thought the letter had been leaked to the media. Let's try a case of rocket science. Here's an article in the Wall Street Journal on Friday, and here's a story that looks like it might be going away. And somebody says, aha, look, we have something that can kick this story an extra day. Because if Clinton is talking about the draft, he's not talking about the fact that we've had the lowest GNP growth under this administration and any administration in the history of this country. He is not talking about the fact that income equity in this country has gone from 8th to 22nd. He is not talking about the fact that George Bush had four different positions on a civil rights bill in two months. He is not talking about the fact that taxes have gone up for the middle class while services have gone down. This seems to be a very appealing thing to have him be talking about the draft and something that happened 23 years ago. So what we'll do is we will leak this to the press and we will get the microphone in Bill Clinton's face talking about something that is not particularly advantageous to him and something that the voters care very little about. And we will block him out from talking about things that got him to 37 percent and made him the leading candidate. You understand? That's the way a political strategist thinks. OK, just like James Carville did talking to reporters. Bill Clinton stayed focused on his larger message. Here's a Clinton TV ad that ran just before the New Hampshire primary, 
with the candidate looking into the camera. I got into politics to change people's lives for the better. And for 11 years, that's what I've worked to do. For better jobs and better education, for health care, to solve social problems, to bring people together. That's what we need to do in America today. Put our own house in order, restore the middle class, reduce poverty, organize this country to compete and win again. I've got a fine national economic strategy, but in the end, a plan is still a piece of paper. To change lives, you need vision and leadership and action. That's the work of my life, and that's why I'm running for president. Paid for by Clinton for president. And the day before the primary, on February 17, 1992, Bill Clinton was focused not on the other Democratic candidates, but on President Bush. And I want to tell you something. Whatever else happens, and whatever happens here tomorrow, I want to tell you this, and you can write this down. Unlike George Bush, I do not believe that concern for New Hampshire is something that's just like the Olympics. It happens once every four years. Could you believe, I mean, could you believe Bush showed up here with Schwarzenegger? Probably thought he needed a bodyguard. I can see it now. You know, it was uh, the movie Terminator meets the Jobs Terminator. <laughs> this is President's Day. You know, we honor Washington and Lincoln. Washington has a monument. Lincoln has a memorial. Bush has every unemployment office in America for Which brings us to the night of February 18th, 1992, right back where we opened this podcast. Paul Tsongas winning New Hampshire with a third of the vote and Bill Clinton coming in second with a quarter of the vote. Here's more from Bill Clinton. This has been a tough campaign, but at least I proved one thing. I can take a punch. When you look at the results of this evening, however it comes out in the later hours, it will not have been a very good night for the status quo crowd in Washington, and it'll be a great night for those of us who believe in change. We began this campaign in New Hampshire, fighting for the forgotten middle class, the people who've been left out and left behind here. People who never gave up on me are themselves, are their country. You people here in New Hampshire have continued to fight in the face of layoffs and cutbacks and foreclosures and a president who hasn't cared. And I want to say this to you, for the first time in my life after being in 17 other campaigns, three days in a row I have met three Americans who broke down crying telling me about their problems. And I want you to remember this, whatever the final outcome of the vote, unlike this president, I will never forget New Hampshire. And now a bonus clip. We've been talking about the Democratic race in New Hampshire in 1992. What about the Republican side? Just like we heard from the second place finisher for the Democrats, here's the second place finisher for the Republicans. I would tell my friends in the national press, Standing before me are the people who have already made history, and we're going to make more history. We are going to take our party back from those who have walked away from us and forgotten about us. And when we take our party back, we are going to take our country back. take America back, we are going to make her great again because there's nothing wrong with putting America first. That was Pat Buchanan, February 18, 1992, 
with some language you might recognize from more contemporary Republican times. Pat Buchanan got 38 percent of the vote in the 1992 New Hampshire Republican primary. President George H.W. Bush, running for re-election, got 53 percent in carrying the state. Pat Buchanan didn't win New Hampshire, but by mounting a strong primary challenge, he did deep damage to the incumbent Republican, which leads to a rare bonus bonus clip. Four years later, Pat Buchanan ran again, and in 1996, he won the New Hampshire Republican primary, beating Bob Dole by one percentage point. All the forces of the old order are going to rally against us. The establishment is coming together. You can hear them right now. The fax machines and the phones are buzzing in Washington, D.C. Well, you got to get together. Somebody's got to get out and take on this guy. We've got to have one guy take him on, but I'll tell you what. We don't have time. We need the troops. We need the troops, but I'm telling you this. You need, you need the troops? You need the troops, but I'm telling the folks out in the country. They're going to come after this campaign with everything they got. Do not wait for orders from headquarters. Mount up, everybody, and ride to the sound of the guns. <laughs> and now that moment in New Hampshire primary history is worth its own podcast. Finally, a historical footnote. President Bush lost his re-election bid in 1992 to Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton became the first president to get elected despite not winning the New Hampshire primary. It's a feat that has happened two other times. In 2000, by George H.W. Bush's son, George W. Bush, and by Barack Obama in 2008. He lost the New Hampshire primary that year to Bill Clinton's wife, Hillary Clinton. And... In January 1998, President Bill Clinton testified under oath that, indeed, he had had a sexual encounter with Jennifer Flowers. That's it for this episode of C-SPAN's A Weekly, a reminder that you can do your own searches in the C-SPAN video library. For other legendary moments in New Hampshire primary history, or anything else you want, just go to cspan.org and use the search bar on top. It's free. And after winning over new friends with all the great video you'll find, you too will forever be known as the Comeback Kid. Thanks for listening, and happy searching. Music